Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Bible Beyond Black and White, our series about how we might be able to enter into the biblical narrative, the biblical narratives, in a way beyond literalism. And so uh, before we dive into the content for today, I just want to give you a little bit of a preview of what's to come. So we started this whole journey um, with my not really knowing how or when it would end. And so I've been thinking a little bit about that. Where we could do what we're, we've been doing uh, almost indefinitely because there's a lot in the Bible. And so what I thought I would do instead is actually look at Easter as the end for this series. And so today we're going to finish up our conversation about the flood, and then we're going to begin our conversation about Abraham and Isaac. And then after that, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to move into talking about Jesus and Jesus' temptations, Jesus' crucifixion, and Jesus' resurrection. So that will be the last three sessions that we'll do together. And then after that, we'll take a little bit of a break, and then we'll begin a new Bible study series after that. So I'll give you more details as they become clearer, but I did want to just let you know that we've got about three more sessions after this one of this particular Bible study, and then we'll have something else um, coming up after that. Any questions about that? Sounds good. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so let me review our goals. Each time we get together in this class, we're going to do some learning, some unlearning, and we're going to seek to empower ourselves to enter into the biblical narrative in maybe some new ways. And we're going to look at ways people have done that throughout history. We're going to today look at the binding, as it's known, the binding of Isaac. Before we do that, though, the last time we got together, we talked about the flood. We talked about Noah's Ark, and we talked about a couple of different ways to approach interpreting that story. One of those was the historical critical method, and we talked about that documentary hypothesis that keeps coming up, the idea that the Genesis narrative that we are presented with is actually a composite of different sources taken from different places and time periods, each with different goals, in fact, and they've been edited into the single narrative that we get. So we talked about that with, um, with the story of the flood and Noah's Ark and looked at how there are some, um, some contradictions, some differences in the narrative as it progresses, as to how many animals were on the ark, as to how long it rained, as to a whole variety of details. We also talked a little bit about a kind of a comparative mythology approach, looking at this one event in the ancient world and seeing how it manifests itself, not only in the Bible, but in other cultural traditions as well. Then we talked about the literal or historical grammatical approach to interpreting the flood. And then we talked about how it's initiated um, an, an entire field of study known as creation science, an attempt that folks who have a scientific background make to justify, to argue that the events that took place in Genesis were literally real. And we looked at the Institute for Creation Research and looked at their upcoming exhibition on dinosaurs and how dinosaurs and human beings lived at the same time. And, um, and, and so this one story has generated so much discussion, um, so much research, and also an incredible amount of creativity. And that was how we ended last time. I'm talking about ways that poets and activists have used the story of the flood to wake people up to certain kinds of realities, whether that's the reality of institutionalized slavery or that's the reality of climate change. And so we ended last time talking about 
if we were to be rewriting the story of the flood, the story of the destruction of the universe, or rather the earth, um, what might we think leads to that destruction today? If it's not a flood, what might it be instead? And I got a couple of uh, responses from folks that were very interesting. Some, unsurprisingly, were pretty dark. And so I'm wondering, is there anyone who might like to just talk a little bit about that? What, what occurred to you looking at the landscape of the reality that we're in? Where do you see destruction happening? It's a judge-free zone. Uh -huh. <laughs> if, you're, okay. if it's dark, that's okay. Go that's ahead, Gail. Can you hear me? I yes, will, we can oh, hear sorry. you. Go ahead, John. Who, who, me? You go ahead, Julia. Uh, yeah. I have to tell y'all that um, Marsha and I must have talked for half an hour or so after class ended last time because we were already so so intrigued by that question, you know, and and I don't think we were having any problem coming up with what are, <laughs> what are the horrible bad things that could it could be. It was trying to actually name what could be powerful enough that even God would would say, "I'm done with you." I mean, we can't fix this, you know. Um, I, I will say that when I sat down to write, the only way I could even begin to write was if I saw God as um, an entity that changes and grows God's self, because it seems to me that there's, I've always read the flood is that God felt kind of bad about it in the end, you know, that- Repented that, of his- Yeah, yeah and that, um, <laughs> and so even though there's the fire next time statement that somehow, there's an out from this as far as God's creativity is concerned, God's creativity for being more loving, more understanding, more even continually creative. But it, in the writings I sent you, Tony, I really found that there was the, there was actually an irony that God experiences because even as God continues to increase in God's love and creativity and all of that, humans can't catch up. And we have so much power we have uh, we we are way behind God, but we're we're still in that, you know, thirstiness and judgment, judging and all those different things. And that we basically we we um, we are the fire ourselves, the planet. We are the ones who create the destruction of humankind because um, we're of our, basically our greed. It's our greed and unwillingness to share, even though there is plenty. So we use up the earth. And it's, hmm. that, that's just kind of where my brain went. But God had to be not so the same entity that God ever was. God mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Julia. So there's an idea in a way that human beings were the flood. That human beings were the cause of our own destruction in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. I said, but God gave us that power to be self-destructive. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. What about other folks? Anyone else want to share their kind of updated take on the destruction of the earth story? Tony, I can say I chose not to do that. <laughs> and I can, I can either say that I, chose not to do it because I didn't listen to the recording until yesterday. So I didn't have time, but I think the reality is, is that I'm working very hard not to go there in my head. That is just overwhelming. And I'm trying very hard to, to do what's in front of me that I can do um, and make a difference where I can make a difference and climate change. I don't think is where I can do anything. Hmm. Interesting. Well, in a way, Gail, you know, you're naming that and kind of setting that kind of psychological boundary even for yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about climate change as sort of 
in a way offering an answer like climate change is sort of the reality that we're facing that feels overwhelming um, in a really big way and it's it's hard to know what if anything there is to do about it um, and so even in, in you're just naming that you kind of articulates where for you the overwhelming reality destructive force is hmm. it's climate change yeah thanks for offering that well, Tony yeah, John go ahead what Gail said I didn't get it till Thursday either but I just scribbled some notes down that I'd like to read uh, a great flood has engulfed us again worldwide did you notice Ask the Amazon natives who search for wood that was once plentiful. <laughs> ask the ones in bread lines worldwide who only ask for a crust of bread. Ask the homeless, the CEOs, the Christians, the Muslims, the Jews, the Buddhists, the Sikhs. All will have different answers of what to do and what to value but all will have a common origin, this flood we're now in. It is not a flood of water this time, but the spin drift foaming off of the huge bifurcated magnetic waves that allows Schrodinger, Schrodinger's cat as well as the rest of us, to be both alive and dead at the same time. Much as our IA-driven feelings and emotions and 24-hour news cycles and the host of noise and images are all about us, we must begin to channel a different voice that still small voice of our common hearts. Once connected and listening, regardless of all the dualistic noise that seems defining and ever present deafening, our heart's voice will be heard in a quantum entanglement with all of nature. Wow, John, thank you so much. There was all kinds of interesting invocations there, Schrodinger's cat and quantum realities. And I, I think what I was really hearing in that, tell me if, I'm, if I was understanding it right, kind of like Julia, you were naming that the arrangement of society as it is, is sort of the destructive reality that we're encountering that we're conjuring and and y'all naming that really brings to light the fact that as when the biblical text was put down onto parchment human beings capacity to create and destroy was much more limited than it is now and so you know y'all moving to the place that well human beings ourselves we're in a self-destructive pattern uh, of overwhelming possibilities it just makes a ton of sense yes thanks for offering that carla were you about to share something i was um but wow john <laughs> I, I don't know what i can say after that but i was kind of in uh gail's uh place of not really being able to come up with anything, but listening to all of this, it struck me, Gail, that you now feel overwhelmed by global warming and climate change as we all do. But we grew up thinking we were going to be, you know, annihilated by a nuclear bomb. None of us even talk about that anymore. They're still around just like they were, and they probably are more dangerous than they were back when it was just us and the Russians. And now, you know, anyway, it's funny. I, I, it's funny to me in a, not in a ha-ha way, but in a peculiar way that we now focus so much on climate change. 
And it sometimes, I mean, I'm I'm not Pollyanna-ish about this, but if you are, I mean, it, I, there have always been humans on this earth that destroyed the environment that they were in by overuse. And I can't name chapter and verse, but I bet there's some people that went through a famine because they did something stupid. Well, like the Dust Bowl, for instance, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, water. sometimes I just wonder if there's anything new under the sun ever, you know, if, you know, if, if your whole little community dies out because you over planted corn instead of wheat, you know, you're all still dead, you know, and that was pretty catastrophic to those people, you know. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. It says you're muted now. Wait a minute. I'm muted. No, no. Okay. No. Was the thing is, it was just when y'all were talking, I was, I was thinking, which would we rather though be subject to? A God who is all powerful, who's going yes, to make God's really. decisions. <laughs> and so, you know, maybe you were totally innocent, but you're going down. Um, or the fact that it does feel like there's not much we can do about it, except there really is something we can do about it. We're talking about it. We're, you know, things actually have, things are happening. So in other words, I think it's evolution to the good. It just requires us to not be you know, dumb, incapable animals, you know. <laughs> Julia, you're always so upbeat. <laughs> We're not doing a very good job of it. <laughs> but. Well, you know, this it's this is a conversation that that could continue on because you know we're we're kind of getting right at I think a a big bruise, wound, incision in all of our lives as we contemplate in some real ways total destruction. And it, it happens it, it we could talk about politics, we could talk about guns, we could talk about climate, we could talk about a whole variety of things. And part of what we are engaging in by doing this is by let, is letting the biblical text help us more deeply interact with some of the most difficult realities we're facing. And that is what, folks have been doing with the Bible for millennia. Having these stories help us deal with, talk about, engage with realities that are just maybe too difficult to engage with just on their own. We can use these metaphors and these stories as ways to situate ourselves in a whole history of human realities or human stories that help us wrap our arms around what can feel like unwieldily large realities. We're gonna do that again today in one way or another by talking about the sacrifice of Isaac. And so let me invite you to help me read this story. It's a little bit long. It's a, it'll be about three different slides. And so let's kind of break them up together. I'll read the first one. And then when I move to the next one, feel free, anyone, to just jump in and start reading. Sometime later, this is, by the way, from Genesis chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice Isaac there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. 
and he himself carried the fire and the knife. Would someone like to read this passage for us? I can read. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Thank you so much, Susan. And the final slide. Can someone read that? I'll read it. <clears throat> Thanks, Rachel. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And actually, there's one more slide that I'll go ahead and read. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Okay, so there's the story. What initial reactions, or, or maybe not so initial, since I assume that y'all have read or heard this story before, what hits you about it? My initial reaction is God already knows everything that's going to happen. If God already knows what's going to happen, what's his point? It must be something to do with teaching or having Abraham, etc. go through the process. He already knows Abraham's going to do it, but Abraham doesn't. You know, this first time he's heard of this, maybe he's come to a realization or something uh, some kind of teaching or something okay. so it, it's interesting to me along those lines what is god trying to teach mm -hmm. why why this story why is this happening if we presume that god is omniscient then what's the point of this story okay yeah thanks john yeah gail oh I mean, Susan, I'm sorry. No, Gail, go ahead first. Okay. Uh, um, well, my, my first thought was, if I believe God had told me to kill my son, I would be done with God. That's it. You're out of here. I'm out of here. You're out of here. Mm -mm, no. That could not be part of any plan of any God that I would understand. <laughs> because he wouldn't have told me what was the things were going to come out differently. Number one, number two, um, it, it bothers me that it, it says several times, my only son, my only son, when the stories tell us that he certainly had another son, right. Ishmael. So 
Was that edited out later or what? Um, so I'm puzzled by that. Right. Well, and you'll remember, just to your point, Gail, that before this scene, God had instructed, well, rather, Sarah had instructed Abraham to get rid of Hagar, her handmaiden, and the son that she bore with Abraham, Ishmael, send them out into the desert, get rid of them, because they don't need to be around anymore. Isaac. Well, that had already happened. That had already happened. Ah. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, yeah, it, why it says your only son when Ishmael had existed and, and in fact uh, still existed at this point. Um, but maybe the, the author is or the, the writer is thinking, well, maybe Ishmael's dead uh, because he's been sent away. So we're going to get into a little bit about how the documentary hypothesis, this idea that Genesis in particular, but other places in the Bible are a composite of different sources. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. But uh, the, the point I'm hearing you say, Gail, also, is if this is something that God had instructed, well, I'm done with God. Done. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you. Also, you Susan, what were you thinking? I, I was going to say, I, I personally don't think God knows everything that's going to happen. This is something that actually comes up a lot in my conversation with patients because, you know, to me, God gave people individual will. And so since people have individual will, they could decide a number of things in a variety of directions. And so I actually don't think God knows what's going to happen. I think God gives us opportunities and we can either, you know, open the door or not. And sometimes we don't even see the door. Um, but yeah, I don't believe that. I, I think this trouble, this story is like one of the most troubling in the Bible. And for like my friends who are atheists, they are the ones that are like, you know, this is effed up. Like, this is why religion is horrible. Um, and it is, I think, one of the most damning kind of stories. Now, I love the way you approached it in a sermon that you had in the last six months, where you talked about the idea of people being under pressure and kind of making decisions out of desperation and kind of out of a sense of impulsivity. And I love the way you framed that because that was like the first time the story ever made some kind of sense to me where you can be in such a bad headspace that you're just not even thinking rationally and you're going to kind of extreme destructive behavior because you just don't even know what else to do. So when you shared that, I was like, oh, okay, I actually get this now. But prior to you sharing it in that way, I just thought, like my atheist friends, like this is effed up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, Gretchen. Well, one of the things that comes to my mind just from the previous stuff is that it's, the exact opposite of the Adam and Eve thing where, you know, God tells Adam and Eve not to eat the apple and they eat it anyway. And then, or not to, you know, eat the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right. And then, <clears throat> you know, then uh, Abraham is a good boy and goes, you know, and is, willing to slaughter his son and uh, for obeying God, he's rewarded. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so it's like kind of like it does, both stories have to do with some sort of trust and obedience that's beyond my comprehension in a way. Yeah, it it's puzzling in a whole variety of ways how we make sense of this story and depending on how we 
make sense of God or the way that we believe God exists in the world and acts in the world, this story is either in alignment or really challenges that. And so let's talk a little bit about how people have interpreted this story. And we'll start with the kind of literalist historical grammatical approach. So in one view, there's the idea that if we begin with the context in which this story was written by Moses, again, this is that's the tradition and that's what this belief is, um, it, it was an attempt to basically proclaim that the common cultural practice of child sacrifice has no room in the religion of the Israelites. And so that's one way that people interpret this story was God saying to the Israelites, no more child sacrifice, don't ever do that at all. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way that people will read this story literally that this literally happened and and it's sort of a way of god entering into the historical context in which this was written and so the other way the more common way is to look at this story as a prefiguration of jesus and so this again proceeds from the idea that the bible is the inerrant word of God, and all of it, particularly the Hebrew scriptures, all of it points towards Jesus' coming, Jesus' death, and Jesus' ultimate resurrection. And so they, this view interprets this story as having all of these different allusions to Jesus' coming. Um, so Isaac, in particular, is thought of as a prefiguration of Jesus. Isaac was a willing sacrifice, is the, is the idea here. We don't really hear from Isaac, except that he's confused, right? In the story, what he says is, hey, I see all the stuff for the sacrifice, but I don't see the thing to be sacrificed. And then Abraham just says, God will provide. Okay. And that's also a piece of this, is that God provides the sacrifice. The idea is that God provides the ram in Genesis, and God provides Christ in the New Testament. Then, in addition, there's some more kind of detail parallels. Isaac carries the wood for the burnt offering on his shoulder in the way that Jesus carries the wood of the cross. Um, there's the, the whole connection between I, uh, Abraham the father sacrificing Isaac his son and God sacrificing God's son Jesus. And so there's all of this commentary about how this story um, is really about Jesus. So there's that. Then the historical critical, the more progressive approach to understanding this story begins again with that documentary hypothesis. The idea that this story, like the flood story, like the creation story, is drawn from a couple of different sources. One reason folks believe that is that this, is, this story features Abraham assuming a really different posture with God than Abraham has previously in Genesis. And so take a look at this moment in Genesis chapter 18. This is God and Abraham discussing, as you'll see, Sodom and Gomorrah. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sins so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. Then the men who were there with Abraham turned away and went toward Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached God and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you, God, to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth 
do right. And so we have a sense where Aram's pleading for strangers, right? Strangers. And Sodom and Gomorrah is saying, are you going to kill all these people? What about the good people that are there? After this moment, God and Abraham go back and forth where they're sort of negotiating about the adequate number of righteous people. And then God says, well, what if I can't find 50? I mean, and then Abraham says, well, aren't 10 enough? And they kind of just go back and forth. And so in this story, God says to Abraham, go ahead and sacrifice your only son. And Abraham doesn't even respond. Abraham just gets to work. And so that's one reason why folks think that this, this story has maybe been edited in ways and kind of pieced together. The other reason is that if you remember back to our discussions about the documentary hypothesis, there are a couple of different sources. There's that P source, that priestly source that we see showing up in Genesis 1, that kind of well-ordered description of how creation happened. And then there's the Yahwist source where we see the appearance of the phrase Lord, the Lord, as sort of a transliteration and translation of Yahweh, four letter word in Hebrew, Lord, four letter word in English. And then there's also, there's a lot of debate about this third source, but it's called the E sourced, which stands for Elohist. And that is, the idea is that there are moments when the word Elohim appears in Hebrew to refer to God. And if you trace that, you kind of get a consistent separate narrative. So we have these three different sources, all based on Hebrew and how these, these stories come across in Hebrew. Um, but then also, even in the English translation, there are some interesting departures that we see. So I'm going to show you a moment here where we see the word Yahweh appear in the story. So in verse 11 and, verses 11 and 12, Abraham says, here I am after God calls, uh, or the angel calls. And then the angel says, do not lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Then in, chapter, in verse 13, we see Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram. Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And so in verse 12, we see the word God used. And then in verse 13, we see the phrase the Lord used or Yahweh used. And so the idea, according to the documentary hypothesis, there's one, maybe one more example. Yeah. And then in chapter or in verse 15, the angel of the Lord, rather than the angel of God, called to Abraham. And so the idea is that, in fact, the Yahwist um, source or, or the editors took the Yahwist source and inserted it into the story and then re-edited it so that it made sense as a single narrative, even though the, the different language for God was retained. And there's this thinking about this because there are other Jewish sources and um, reflections on this story that have kind of alternate endings. So there is a whole tradition of Jewish interpretations and Midrash and Talmudic interpretations and oral traditions that say, in fact, it was not the angel who stopped Abraham from committing this sacrifice, but it was Abraham himself that, like we see in the whole Sodom and Gomorrah moment, Abraham argues with God and ultimately says, no, I'm not going to do this. So there's a whole tradition of interpretation that holds that that's how this story goes. Then there's another um, sort of alternate ending to this story in which Abraham actually goes through with it. 
and sacrifices Isaac. And, and, the, and there's actually some people point to kind of textual evidence in this story as it appears in Genesis um, to support that idea. And that is the final verse in the story in verse 19. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba. And the idea is, or the question is, why isn't Isaac mentioned? And so because in every other place, it's Abraham and Isaac are doing some kind of action. But here, it's just Abraham. And so we can kind of make of that what we want to, but some people have made of it. That is evidence that this is an edited story. And in at least one version of it is preserved the idea that Abraham successfully, in fact, sacrificed Isaac. And, um, and there are descriptions in um, Hebrew poetry and other sources that talk about um, kind of the violence of that moment and, and it actually taking place. And then finally, one other way of thinking about this story tries to answer the question of why. All right, so let's say this is documentary, uh, the, the documentary hypothesis is correct. And this is a composite story. Why is it preserved in the Hebrew scriptures? What's the point? And so Karen Armstrong, the author of the book that I've mentioned a couple of times, The Lost Art of Scripture, her belief is that this story is included in the Hebrew scriptures as a way of the editors who included it and edited it um, are commenting on the state of things in which they were editing. In other words, it's part of a whole what she describes kind of exilic reality where there's this story of exile that the Israelites are grappling with that dates back to the creation story where you have this beautiful state <clears> of harmony <throat> and then something dramatic and terrible happens, and then there's an exile from the Garden of Eden. We have this other state of the pre-flood reality, um, or even before that, there was a sense of harmony and community, and then after a crisis of degradation, a flood comes and washes everyone away. And there's this sort of pattern of togetherness and exile, togetherness and exile. And so for her, this story points to the fact that while the Israelites are in a state of exile as they're editing these stories, because if you remember back, the canonization process of the Hebrew scriptures happened during exile, while the Israelites had, after the destruction of the temple, after the Israelites have been driven out of Judea and they're now in this diaspora. And that's sort of part of the process of uh, creating these scriptures. These, this group of people who have lost their sense of identity needing to come together and create a common story. And for Karen Armstrong, that story features this pattern because it's something that they're experiencing. And so the idea is that while God has created this horrible reality, just at the end, God can still come and turn everything around. And so this story is a way of this sort of uh, familial crisis ends up being a metaphor or a description of this larger national crisis that the Israelites are in. Now, whether or not that is convincing to you is another question, but it is for her, again, um, the way that the biblical stories can enter into our current reality and help us make sense of it. What are y'all's questions and, and reactions to, to that? Uh, Tony, Tony yeah. uh, when you use the word metaphor, it just popped into my mind. What is God a metaphor for? Yeah, it's a great question, um, John. I think for 
Karen Armstrong, what she would say is that part of the reason why the editors included this story in the Hebrew scriptures was because it was an attempt to say that their exile and their national crisis wasn't just a result of sin, that they were being punished for something that they had done, but that God was actively involved and was um, basically awaiting the right moment to dramatically save everything and then make good on the promise that God made to Isaac that everything, you, you won't have to worry anymore, that you are blessed and I'm this covenant that I had promised you will happen. And so in that sense, God isn't actually a metaphor. God is sort of a character in the story of the Israelites' national identity, moving from these various states of exile and destruction into, the hope is, a state of renewal and redemption. So it, it's more that Abraham and Isaac end up being sort of metaphors in that sense. When, when, I, um, when I read the Old Testament, um, part of what I am trying to understand is how these ancient people imagined God. So the imagination, the, their their idea of what God was like, and you know, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I I understand that they saw God as jealous. They saw God as vengeful. It's really hard for me to understand. I mean, there's archaeological evidence in a, a whole lot of places in the world that a whole lot of ancient religions included child sacrifice. I have a really hard time understanding what, how they imagined a God that was appeased by or demanded child sacrifice. I don't understand that as being a part of world religions pretty much all over the world. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great point, Marsha. And it's, um, I mean, there's some of that evidence points to the fact that the Israelites themselves engaged in child sacrifice. And, you know, I think that the idea of sacrifice itself is, is a difficult one for many of us in this day and age. But the idea that you would sacrifice various kinds of things to your God, anything from crops that you would burn to livestock that you would burn to a person is all indications the value of the thing that you are sacrificing um, is an indication of your of your commitment and devotion to the deity and so and it also these rituals often follow a narrative a, a, what we might call a mythology a scripture or whatever that it has echoes of these sacrifices. And so, you know, the story of um, fathers in particular killing their sons is an ancient one. I mean, there's the Greek god Cronus who eats his children. There's, there's all of these different kind of foundations for this idea. And there's a whole variety of ways to try to make sense of how this could how this could be, how this could be a thing that human beings would decide to do. Um, but there's even our, our, some of our cultural ideas around marriage have to do with a kind of sacrifice, depending on how traditional you approach that idea. Um, and so anyway, this is a long way of not answering that question, Marsha, because it is an enormous one. And I think it's a fascinating one. And I'm actually thinking about um, maybe putting together a series about sacrifice in particular, because it shows up in so many places in the Bible, but then in elsewhere, um, even in the way that some activists talk about our work, even in the way many Christians talk about our purpose. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, it's something that I, I think we need to get more into more than we can now. I, I want to say one more thing. I, I do see, like, like when we think about humans imagining a God who would be appeased by the sacrifice of a child or the sacrifice of a virgin, um, that's just, I just can't 
figure how humans got there or imagining a God who eats his own children. But it's not, in some ways, it's not any less unimaginable than the humans we are now who are willfully destroying our own planet um, and destroying the water that we need to drink and destroying the air that we need to, to breathe. Humans don't make sense. We don't, I mean, we don't make sense in the way we we treat each other or the way we treat the planet or the way we imagine God. It doesn't make I've, sense. I've got to add, it's screaming <laughs> in my mind is we can't imagine sin, you know, saying to God, we would sacrifice our child. We send children to war all the time. We sacrifice them for our country or for our democracy or whatever it is we've decided is worth sacrificing our children for, which makes me wonder if what God was doing with Abraham is saying, will you sacrifice your child for me? If my belief is that we are God for something you believe in, for your heart, for the good, don't do it, but you would, you would have. But we throw our kids at war all the time. And I, I think our real test is not whether we would sacrifice our children or ourselves, is for what? That's such a great point. Thank you, Julia. Well, in a little bit of levity, any of us who are parents, haven't we wanted to kill our children at one time? <laughs> <laughs> we won't quote you <laughs> oh yes oh yes well um yeah i i, I had um, a series of things that i wanted to show y'all and i will next time um but i i, I want to name also that in karen armstrong's book part of what she does in looking at the way religions have developed is by she kind of roots a lot of the issues that some of us are naming in the development of agrarian societies. And she does that because mm -hmm. what that did, that movement toward agriculture, it created a class division so that there were those who labored in the land and then those who benefited from that. And so that class division her and her argument ends up mirroring the way that human beings start to think about the divine rather than the divine being in everything. The divine is the highest class. And so in a way to appease the way that appeasement happens is through sacrifice and it's transactional. And so I give you this land, you work this land, and I pay you, you give me, there's this whole sense of transaction, retribution. And so the rituals that these religions develop are rooted in that same idea of transaction, that if I give this to God, God will give this to me. And so, again, based on how much you sacrifice, it demonstrates the value and the intensity and the level of your devotion. And the idea is how much reward you will get later. And so if you're on the brink of famine and you, it hasn't rained in ever, I mean, you might be thinking about sacrificing something incredibly dear to you in order to bring about this thing that everyone needs. And so, again, for me, a lot of it is when, when we're desperate in grief or anger or helplessness, we're liable to do some, some wacky stuff as human beings and build whole justifications for it. Um, and again, so that's kind of my take on some of these questions is that so much of what our issues are, are uh, the way religion manifests itself is in a conversation about transaction about uh, and so you see in this moment in Sodom and Gomorrah right Abraham saying well God how could you do this there's righteous people here too they haven't they done enough not to be killed with everyone else and so it gets into a debate about numbers well how many righteous people and they land on one can we just find one and um, 
so anyhow, the, the, the story is um, of how we get to this place of sacrifice is long and complicated and just to, to the point we're making, it's everywhere. In the context of the story of the Christian God, however, the sacrifice of Isaac is marks this moment of um, of curiosity, of mystery, of devastation. And so the question for us is not just how do we make sense of it by looking at the documentary hypothesis or trying to think about how this prefigures Jesus or what have you, but I think for us, in, in the context of this class anyway, the question is, well, how can we use this story to help us better understand or better enter into realities that are happening today? And the next time we get together, we're going to look at the way in particular artists have done that, how they focused on Abraham's psychology or maybe Isaac's psychology or they have put this story in a larger national context about war or about uh, sacrifice in other forms. And so with that, I'm just going to invite y'all to be thinking about this question, you know, not, not with any specificity necessarily, but just in general. How might this story help you enter into a national reality? Um, a global crisis, a personal challenge? How might this story help you more faithfully enter into whatever it is you're holding right now? And so with that, I want to thank you all so much for your questions and thoughts and commentaries. Um, and the next time we get together, we will finish up our conversation about Abraham and Isaac and then move into talking about the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. All right, y'all. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Tony.